Well, welcome back, everyone. Thank you to our break sponsor, Nestle Professional. Hopefully you had a chance to make the za'atar, ragu, and hummus from the recipe inspiration we shared with you on Monday and uh, made a, a number of uh, valuable uh, connections. I hope you all found the break, breakout sessions valuable uh, and you, you enjoyed our various networking um, activities. Uh, and I just wanna mention before we jump into the next session, we have a new poll for you asking about supply chain challenges related to health and sustainability uh, that you might be experiencing. So be sure and uh, go and check that out and then we'll see uh, the results of the poll a little bit later on. And now I'm pleased to welcome back to the stage, Russell Walker to introduce and lead our next general session, the supply chain disrupted, reassessing in light of the pandemic, climate change and planetary health. Russell, over to you. Great, thanks, Greg. It's a real pleasure to lead this panel and I've got two fantastic panelists joining us right now. I'd like to introduce them. First is Michael Hamm. He's on the Menus of Chain Scientific and Technical Advisory Council. He's Professor of Sustainable Agriculture and Senior Fellow at the Center for Regional and Food Systems at Michigan State University. Joining him is Tim York, who is the immediate past president of Marcon Cooperative, one of the most respected produce marketing cooperatives in the country. Michael and Tim, welcome to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you, good morning. Good morning. Well, we set this up for a little uh, preliminary and, and maybe prepared remarks. So, um, Mike, maybe you could share with us um, some of your perspective on how sustainability and climate change and all of these issues are confronting the restaurant industry and your thoughts on what they might um, be looking for and what they should do. Sure. Well, thank you, Russell, very much. And welcome to everybody that's, that's online right now. Um, a couple of thoughts. My focus is on regionalized food systems, which I think of as regions increasing the amount of food that's, uh, that they can produce and, and process and, and supply within a region, but keeping connections to national and global supply chains because in a, in a period of greater uncertainty with climate change and with water stresses that that's gonna uh, bring, bring about along with other things, there's probably gonna be disruptions at the localized and regional level as well as at national and global levels. But um, I think having greater, just greater um, production points and greater distribution possibilities gives us more resilience in the face of climate change and water stresses. So I think that's important. The other piece of it is, I think though, and I think what the pandemic has shown us is, is that um, I, I know a lot of small scale farmers in the area and some of them, their primary market are restaurants, which of course collapsed overnight when all the restaurants were shut down. So they had to scurry real quick to come up with strategies to do more direct marketing directly to consumers and not to restaurants. Hopefully that'll that'll shift back again and they can get back into the restaurant business and restaurants will be able to open and we'll see what happens. But I think that there's a lot of opportunity there across the country for job creation, for um, uh, reducing the uh, greenhouse gas cost of transportation and refrigeration uh, in, in that transportation, especially for fruits and vegetables. There's also real possibilities for thinking about how do we supply year round food um, in places like Michigan, where I am, where we actually have four seasons. Um, we're not Southern California or the Central Valley of California, we have seasons. But for example, we can think of doing tomatoes um, outdoor or in hoop houses all summer. And in hoop houses, we can get an extra two months of harvest. We can think about moving to greenhouse production like they do, like the Dutch do, or like they do in Ontario to great to a great degree more in the winter time, um, or moving somewhat indoors when the light levels are really, really low and everything that you're doing is basically done with lights. And if we think about how we can do that across the seasons, we can think about improving the sustainability and not just going down the road of regionalized at all costs because there's climate implications for some of the strategies that are out there, um, but doing this in a way which 
serves the needs of the industry, builds um, a robust farming base, uh, creates diversity in, su in supply chains and supply points so that we're more resilient to climate change. So I'll leave it go at that for now and, and hopefully there'll be a lot of questions and we can talk later. Great Thank thoughts, you. thanks for sharing that. Tim, please share Great. your Thank you. Michael, thanks for setting the table on that. Um, you know, uh, just a little bit about Mark on Mark on this. Uh, Russell mentioned I just left after 34 uh, years with Mark on, and we were a purchasing and marketing cooperative working with uh, broadline distributors across the U.S. and Canada. And some of the things that you talk about, Michael, particularly is around regionalized food systems, um, presents some challenges for us as broadliners, primarily around logistics. We're really in the logistics business. Mm -hmm. And um, being able to pivot and adjust quickly to new growing areas as production comes in or there's challenges in those areas, that's one of the challenges we've had for years with um, fresh produce and why we've always relied on California so much. And then the other has been in some of those regional areas, um, getting the same assurances around food safety that we expect of our growers in the, in, in the West. So mm -hmm. those are some of the challenges. Certainly you address some of the opportunities and one of them is the, is the freshness and the whole um, aspect around carbon footprint. And, um, but I, I think the regional food system is a, is a direction we need to be, uh, a, a need to be looking and, and, and figuring out better how we do that and we adapt when we have a short window of opportunity, even if it's just for a four or six week growing period in some areas that we're adapting to the opportunity that's that's there. But it is, it, it's not easy with, uh, particularly with broad liners that have a, a wide variety of products. You know, some of our distributors are carrying six to 700 different SKUs and to be able to adjust quickly to new growing areas or regions is a little bit a little bit tougher. Um, I've been involved around sustainability um, since 2008, actually working with a group of people um, on a project called the Stewardship Index for Specialty Crops, developing metrics around sustainability, not telling people how to how to define sustainability, but simply providing some common yardsticks and that that work um, continues. Um, so sustainability is something we've uh, we've focused on for a long time, and um, I'm certainly passionate about as well. So I'll leave it at that as well. Thank you, Russell. Great, great comments. So uh, one of the topics that comes up frequently is climate change. It's it's on the minds of science leaders, of course, that our climate will change. It's also on the mind of political leaders and social leaders that we should move organizations through taxes or tariffs or other incentives to adopt more sustainable and climate-friendly solutions. And then lastly, we, we may have consumers themselves might say, we would only like to buy things that are um, in a way that is climate-friendly. So what are your thoughts on how the industry should prepare for climate change on, on at least these three fronts and any others that you see? Do you wanna go Michael first? Or? Uh, Timothy, you go ahead. Okay. You've got the industry background. I'll come after you this time. First off, I think, uh, for one thing, I, I would say this about um, uh, growers and farmers. You know, they have always proven themselves very resilient, and they um, they may not be so great at looking far down the road, 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, and, and planning around that, but they, they've proven themselves resilient over and over in different different challenges, whether it's around pests or chemicals or whatever it may be proven themselves very resilient. So I have great confidence in the farmers of America that they'll figure this out along the way. But one of the discussions we had earlier, of course, is that there are areas, uh, perhaps in California, that would um, fall out of production or would have to change to different crops. And there would be areas of the country that would become produced in areas that are not today with different climate change. We'll always have the challenge of, of water in California, that's one of the, the really the big issues, water and labor and, and regulatory costs here that um, are not the same around the rest of the country that do open up some opportunities um, uh, for that. And then, of course, when we've seen this, the work that's been done around breeding, whether it's around uh, permanent crops, tree crops, or it's around row crops, um, the seed and technology around planting has um, certainly helped us in some areas, and I would anticipate we would see that same opportunity around uh, climate change. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Michael. Yeah, sure. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, 
these days, I think that a lot of the drive around the food supply and climate change and environmental impacts of the food supply is going to be driven by consumers. I think we're already seeing that. I know at my home institution in Michigan State, um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you would have not had kiosks in the dining halls that were pure vegetarian and vegan. And nowadays, you don't build a dining hall without one. Um, and you, so the plant forward options are really much broader and students are engaging with those a lot more than they used to. The other side of that is, is I think the industry has an opportunity. I think that a lot of the industry now, um, I, I'm working with one company that's not involved in fruits and vegetables, but with other things. And they're looking at how can they be a leader? How can they create metrics for themselves to look across their supply chain for, for the, all the different ingredients that go into their products? And how can they think about reducing their carbon footprint, reducing the water irrigation water usage and things like that? So I think that the, in, the, the pieces of the industry that are smart are gonna be those that look at this proactively and think about how to do it and look at, at it as a business opportunity and not as a business cost. Number two that I would say is, is that we did a study, actually an undergrad with me a number of years ago at MSU, looking at the carbon footprint of, of getting um, lettuce in Michigan from, from Michigan hoop houses in January versus shipping it from California. Mm. And the carbon footprint was much lower getting it from um, um, the hoop houses in Michigan. And the entire difference was, was due to the carbon footprint of transporting that in trucks across the country in refrigerated trucks. That was the difference in the carbon footprint. Wow. And so what that says to me is, is that, um, first of all, I don't think you can take industry averages for all of these kinds of things. I think there needs to be a lot of research to look at with uh, kind of within lettuce, in lettuce, in tomatoes, in these various crops. We can't take a food system average for the cost of transportation because then it looks very low on average, um, because you're including uh, uh, train delivery of grains, which is a very low carbon footprint compared to truck transportation, refrigerated truck transportation of produce. So I think that, um, I think it's gonna be mostly driven by consumers. I think that there is gonna be, I think that anything that comes from the government is gonna be more industry wide on how do we, how, how do we reduce the carbon footprint of transportation, things like that. Um, and again, I'm going to say it is, is that I and I recognize, Tim, that there's huge amounts of, of logistical issues with trying to source from small things. I think that's why food hubs have started to grow up to service restaurants and things like that is because the restaurants don't have time to service 20 or 30 farmers. They want to go to one place to get it. So they're going to a food hub kind of thing to get a lot of the local and regional stuff. So I think those kinds of things and how those feed into broadline distributors to make the whole system more efficient, I think hasn't really been explored to a great degree yet. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there, but I think that the carbon footprint and climate change and water usage are gonna be major issues that are gonna be largely driven by consumers. I'll stop there. Fantastic. I see Kathy's in now. Yes, it's a, a great opportunity to introduce our third panelist, Kathy Burns, who's the CEO of the Produce Marketing Association. Welcome, Kathy. Um, we were just talking about uh, the role of produce over meat and, and Michael sharing his um, expertise on the availability of local solutions, regional solutions. So could you share a bit um, about your perspective from the produce? Oh, did we lose Kathy? Sorry. All right, that was a tease. Well, um, why don't we continue our, our dialogue and hopefully Kathy can join us. I know she's having some technical issues. I think this is one that is fascinating, um, which we are kind of approaching tangentially. But, but you mentioned uh, at, at Michigan State University that there are kiosks for um, people who can have more vegetables, more vegetarian options, a preference for those, in fact, over meat. We see that also here in Seattle and at University of Washington. And so um, this sort of harkens the entire disruption or maybe uh, – um, say sort of uh, this continuity that we're going to have generationally where there's going to be new consumers and those new consumers now I think are really going to become the, the leaders um, and they're going to ask for for those um, but they're going to ask for tasty options so so this is another challenge perhaps for for vegetables and produce how do we produce that how do we bring innovation and, and, and bring selection and Tim, you were talking earlier about you know many maybe rare or, or less commonly grown species how do we do that and still meet these sustainability goals? Can we do that? 
in fact. Yeah, and, and let me pick up a thread too, if I may, um, Russell, from what Michael was saying in, in, in your earlier question, and that is, I think one of the one of the challenges around um, um, say carbon footprint behind a, a product is how do we translate that down to the menu level? How does that ultimate restaurant patron understand that that's different, right? And so when we've talked about innovation, say with a, a broccoli that has uh, twice the vitamin C of a normal uh, or a regular broccoli. If it doesn't look different, the consumer doesn't understand that. And it's particularly difficult at, at food service, even more so at retail, because we can communicate that at retail with, with, with packaging. So I think that when we talk about innovation, it has to be something that we can easily communicate down to that restaurant level. Now, the volume feeders, many of them that are here, you know, you can do that with signage and those kind of things. If you're if you're looking around just independent restaurants up and down the street restaurants, it's going to be a little bit more uh, more challenging around that that innovation piece and really demonstrating that this is different. It's got to be, I think, tangible for a consumer to be able to uh, to see that. I'll give you an example. One of the things we did at Marcon last year was introduce a cardboard um, clamshell for strawberries with a big movement away from plastic. That's a very tangible thing that our operators would be able to see and that we're making a movement away from that. Very easy to see. Whereas if we were talking about, well, we save 50% more water growing these strawberries than other strawberries, it's it's not it's not tangible. So I think that's one of the challenges around innovation is how do we how do we communicate that? Um, um, let me, well, I'll let Mac maybe pick up a thread on there on, on your question, Russell, and I can come back to that. Sure, and I got a follow up for that, but please, Michael. No, go ahead. Why don't you oh, do the, what, Russell, why don't you go ahead with the next so question? The follow up, and, and, um, and I think it's, it's actually a really appropriate one. If we have farmers that are super resilient and they want to grow great crops, and of course they, they want to generate a profit for themselves and their families, and then we have consumers and maybe a, a class or generation of consumers who want to try new things. Could this just be an information problem where specifically what's possible from the farm side is not known by the consumer? You might have alluded to this where a customer doesn't know to try a particular new species or variety. And I recently tried a new, a new variety of cauliflower here grown locally in Seattle. That, that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, and my thought was, well, where has this been all the time? And come to find out it was an heirloom. And it's been around for a long time and um, for some reason just wasn't in the marketplace. And so if if I could build on that example and if, if we somehow could bring more information out, does that close the loop? And, and, and is that the issue or, or could that be a big part of the issue of, of bringing those kind of um, crops and vegetable crops in particular to, to market? Well, I think that I think that's I think that's very, very true, um, Russell. And I think it's around a technology issue. Right. So, you know, where I live here, we've got a um, Monday afternoon uh, farmers market and I see products down there that I don't find in my normal mainstream supermarket. And if I wasn't able to walk down there, I wouldn't know that those were even available to me. Yeah. So yeah. where is a system that would make that available to me if if I'm not able to go to the farmer's market. Where am I, are I going, where am I going to find purslane or something that's a great new salad item that I'm beginning to see on restaurant menus? Where am I going to be able to find that? And I don't, I don't have a vehicle to do that today. So I think there is an information and there's, you know, part of that is a technology solution around sharing that information. Well, well you're right. Markets have always been the place for that, but, but maybe there's a digital solution or a social solution. I don't know, but Seems like we, we probably have more tools than we would realize. So, yeah. Michael, you got any thoughts on this and where you see that? I, 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 I do, actually. And I, I think, well, the first thing is I, I think it I can imagine it would be a challenge depending on the part of the food system that, that people are in, whether it's kind of like, let's say, large scale dining hall versus um, a white tablecloth restaurant or something like that. Dealing with a lot of different varieties of tomatoes, let's say, can be a challenge on one hand or it can be an opportunity on the other hand, depending on the type of, of, right. of market that you're in. So I think that's one thing. I think the other thing, though, I think there's for regionalized systems, I think there are a number of technology issues that aren't really being addressed. I mean, when I look around and this is not going to be a criticism of what of the sector I'm going to mention, but when I look at where venture capital money is going in technology and food right now, 
a lot of it seems to be going into vertical farming. I mean, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars going into, into vertical farming, which is fine. Um, but when I look at kind of small scale producers and stuff, you figure I live in, La in Lansing, Michigan area. We've got about a half million people. Right now, that half million people eats about 350 million pounds of produce a year. And we should probably have about 500 million pounds of produce a year to actually get enough. Well, you're not going to do that on one acre farms, right? We need some scale to it. And for a lot of the farmers to scale up, to get to a point where, A, they're a viable business and can support a family and develop a 401k and have a health insurance plan and all that kind of stuff, they need a sizable income. And they can't keep increasing labor for several reasons um, to do that, which means they need technology for harvesting. They need technology for planting. They need um, technology for weeding. They need technology for decision making. So AI and robotics become very important there and, and appropriate mechanization. But it has to be at a scale and a price point that's useful for somebody who's doing 10, 20, 30, 50 acres of, of fruits or vegetables not somebody that's doing 500 acres or a thousand um and so i think that's another piece of the technology challenge there's kind of all the information transfer and information technology and then there's the production and post-harvest management technology for these kinds of scales that keep that produce a coming in large large enough quantities and b maintaining the post-harvest handling of it so that it's really fresh and you get the advantage of the fact that it's picked close to home and it's picked only a couple days ago. So I'll let it go with that. We got a couple of questions coming from the audience that um, really build on this. So it, it seems we've had different waves of menu and uh, health uh, recommendations and, and they move us closer to something like a Mediterranean diet, uh, more grains, um, mm. less meat. Um, and, and we've heard messages like that. And of course, menus of change um, builds on that with, with greater specificity. Um, but all of those seem to take us right back to California to growing uh, water hungry crops like pistachios and almonds and, um, and so many other things that when measured perhaps with an environmental um, holisticness um, may not be the best choice. Maybe there's something else. And, um, and, and how do we do that? Is that regionality? Can, we might not be able to grow almonds in, in Michigan, but, but what is the solution to that, right? If our solution drives us to crops that, that do have these demands and they're healthy for our bodies, how do we make them healthy for the planet as well? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's probably, that may be question number one, because what you're talking about is how do we shift dietary preference? Um, yes. How do we move people to cons to want to consume a dietary pattern that is more environmentally sustainable? And I, I think the, the, the kind of trite answer is more education, because I think most people don't know that that the, the almonds are so water intensive and it's all it's all mind water. It's not um, rainwater. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so I think that, again, I think part of that is education. I think part of that is having tasty alternatives that still meet the dietary preferences because a lot of the almond consumption is based on people moving away from meat yes. um, and not consuming as much meat. So, you know, so does that mean that that things like oat milk become the dominant factor as opposed to something like almond milk? I don't know the answer to that. Again, it's, it's gonna be education. It's gonna be dietary pattern preferencing. I think some of this is, is going to come down to government regulation because I think, quite frankly, the water is not going to be there. And mm -hmm. so I think the challenges in California with water are real. They're not they're not getting less. They're going to get more. And so I think some of that is going to be managed by um, by that. And I think some of it also is going to be move is going to be increasing productions in areas that are not low water areas. Mm -hmm. So I'll use Michigan as an example. We have actually a lot of fresh water. And our rainfall is not slated to decrease over the next 30 or 40 years. It may come in, in larger bursts, but it's going to stay relatively constant. So, um, you know, we'll see. But I think part of it's going to be that there are going to be government regulations, at least at the at the regional level, like, say, a place, a state like California or something because of water stresses. And number two, I think, is going to be um, more education and more demand from consumers. Great. Tim, any thoughts on that? 
No, I think I don't, I, Michael's spot on. You're probably better versed in that in that area than I am. I just my comment would be when I um, looked at the politics around water in California, there are very powerful interests um, around water policy that's been in place for some in some cases over a hundred years. It's very very difficult to change. Governor Brown tried to do that several years ago and made incremental, minimally incremental. Um, um, progress on that. And it's going to be a very, it's a challenge. It's going to be a challenging um, um, thing for us to be able to address in California. It is. Yeah. And there will be more people needing that water just from um, population use and uh, climatic models suggest less snowfall in the Sierra Nevada. So less mountain fed um, rivers. And yeah. um, we've seen those challenges. Um, other parts of the country like Florida have had long droughts and um, we rely on the South for a lot of productivity. So it's, it's not just California, but um, probably calls into a question, um, how do we prepare for that? And, and does the industry have an aspiration for sustainability, the, the, the food industry or vegetable production industry? And I ask this not, be, not, not to say that we deny that, but, but do they want to market that? Is there a market to say, this is a more sustainable place to produce the product? Like Michael, you said, the hoop houses, um, is that something the industry wants to invest in, do you think? You know, I would say from our standpoint, Russell, we haven't seen a demand for that, for sustainability per se. We have seen a, a demand for more flavorful or more regionalized products, but not something that's quote unquote sustainable per se. Again, mm -hmm. it's because I think it's so intangible to, 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 to talk about, you can you can tell the crispness of this lettuce, you can tell the flavor of this tomato that's been sourced regionally. If, again, coming back to the strawberry example, if they've used 50% less water growing that strawberry, from a consumer standpoint, my real interest is in how does that strawberry taste? Is it fresh? Is it, is it, is it a new flavor experience that I haven't had before? And so while I think from a policy standpoint and, and from a forward-looking standpoint we need as as in the ag community be thinking about sustainability and be be addressing uh, our water and our climate issues and so on i think we're we need to be ahead of the consumer in this case and not not waiting for consumer to tell us what to do yeah that sounds that sounds like a, a good position to be in your thoughts yeah. michael no i would i would agree with that i think that um I think I think sustainability is actually becoming a more nebulous term and not a less nebulous term, um, because I think there's a lot of bandwagon jumping, and um, you know I think it, it gets more and more confusing to people. How do I choose something because everything seems contradictory, and so I think to some degree, there's a there's an element of it right now that I think is going to be a back office um, activity by the industry, by different sectors of the industry and by different individual by individual companies, um, because they see a value in it for them in terms of the the viability of their company long term. Um, and then I think that we need to get a bit more clarity. I think we need to get simpler messages to people about what it means, what a dietary pattern that is more sustainable versus dietary patterns that are less sustainable, recognizing that none of it is going to be perfect. Um, so, you know, I, I think we need to simplify the messages a bit and not, and, and what we're really doing, I think in most cases is making the, con the, the messages more complicated. Mm -hmm. If the industry can get ahead of these notions of sustainability, here's an idea. Uh, we invoked a lot of the climate change and water issues in California, but let's be honest, California is still a superior place to grow many yep. things, many things that we need. Um, and, and maybe that resource, if, if it could be done this way, um, could be managed with a different optimization to say, we will grow those things in California that are so uniquely available only from there and great for our bodies um, in, a, in a spirit to minimize the environmental uh, cost, but then move other things out of California, maybe dairy, maybe meat production to other places. Maybe that would be in Michigan or right here in Seattle or Washington area, right? So that would require an enormous amount of organization, many different parties with different interests. Do you think something like that's possible? 
Well, and if so, how would we get started? Where would that, that leadership come from? <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 I think um, I'm not sure this is really the answer to that question, Russell, but I think when I look at the work that's gone in for 30 years with the industry support, and particularly PMA, and Produce Marketing Association's um, support behind uh, Produce for Better Health organization, trying to move um, people to improve their diet and eating more fresh fruits and vegetables or fruits and vegetables more broadly. You know, we haven't moved the dial, uh, you know, maybe incrementally, maybe from 3.1 to 3.2 servings or something, but it's very incremental change in the 30 years of work when we've tried to educate consumers and encourage consumption because it's better for our bodies. And it's really what we've seen when we talk about COVID and the impact, we have seen clearly the impact of poor diet, poor health on, on certain communities where COVID is much more um, impactful on those communities. You know, it's, it's a great lesson for us right now in the pandemic that we have um, dietary issues we need to be addressing. And we haven't done that as consumers. So I think, while it's aspirational, a lot of the things we're talking about, I think, again, we're, we've got to be thinking about how do we overall increase our consumption of, fresh, of, of fruits and vegetables and um, from a health standpoint. And then one of those other points of interest, sustainability, um, flavor, and all those other things that, that, that are tangential to that. Right. Yep. Michael. So, so yeah, I, I agree with everything Tim said, and then I just want to add to it that, and a number of years ago, I gave a talk in Davis, California about regionalized food systems. And and one of my points was, was that at this moment in time, we need California to do all the production they can. And we need to think of, to, to work at how do we scale up production across the country of a variety of fruits and vegetables, since that's what we're primarily talking about right now. That said, and so what, because right now, if California wasn't doing what they were doing now, it's not like other parts of the country could suddenly pick up the slack. Mm -hmm. um, there's not the producers to do that. Um, we may have the number of farms, but the scale at which those farms can produce because of um, skilled background, uh, capital for mechanization, labor supply, and other kinds of things, I just don't think it would happen. So I think over the next decade, we, we need a concerted effort to think of, to, to work on increasing the farmer base um, across the country and thinking about and and as I mentioned earlier thinking about the technology needs for for that for that development as well as land needs because many of the most of these people are not going to come from farming backgrounds so they don't have a land base that they can move into automatically so there's challenges there um, so there's a whole lot of issues across the country in terms of developing those next generation of farmers and a, giving them the time to develop at a point where they can scale to 10, 20, 30, 40 acres if they want to. Um, and those are the ones that I'm really interested in in our, in our work is, is trying to figure out what are the strategies to allow them to succeed over a five to 10 year period mm -hmm. so they can scale up gradually and not have to do it right away. So I think all of those things are important, but I think it's something that we really need to focus on. If we don't focus on that in the next 10 to 15 years, then I figure it's going to, I'm afraid it's going to be too late to um, to capture the part of California that can't do what it wants, what it's doing now, 20 years from now, mm -hmm. 30 years from now. You do introduce a really um, important and interesting aspect, which is who's going to do the farming. And I can certainly see it in, in universities I've been associated with, less people going into agricultural sciences than generations mm -hmm. past. And of course, we we have a uh, more industrialized, uh, scalable you know, agricultural system, but uh, we, we don't encourage people necessarily to, to go in that career path. We hear, you know, get a tech job, um, work in an urban area, and, uh, and then the farmers find that their children don't want to do it. And so um, is there an answer to that? Does it start in universities and we elevate the role of, of producing food? You know, I, I, I would say, you know, Russell, one of the things that, that we've talked about within the, the produce industry is um, the, the, the people we need in agriculture are different than we needed 10, um, 15, 20 years ago. We need um, people that are versed in AI. We need people that are um, 
engineers to build the new equipment and, and robotics. And we need the scientists. You know, you look at something like Aero Farms with the, the MIT grads that are, that are manipulating or, or using that data to manipulate the product quality and flavor of the crops they're growing. That's a whole different skill set than than the, the growers that have just grown up and, you know, my dad farmed, so I'm going to farm just like him. The, 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 the broad range of people that we need within our industry to move us forward is very different. Um, and that's one of the things we, we need to be communicating about is the opportunity within ag around technology and other, other um, um, uh, areas of employment. Sounds great. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, it's real pleasure to be with you today. Michael and Timothy, thank you for your contribution. You're welcome. And uh, thank Sarah, you. I'll hand it back to you. Um, thanks to everybody who joined us today on the panel. No, and thank you so much, Russell, Michael, and Tim, for bringing everyone together around this incredibly important issue and obviously one that we can continue to talk about for many minutes to come. We are now going to go into our final event of the day, our networking reception. But before we depart, let's take a look at our poll results. So the question that we had, which category that supports health and sustainability are you most challenged in, produce, in procuring during the pandemic? Our answer right now is compostable disposable goods at 49%, but followed closely by local meat, fish, and poultry. And when we look at what association these challenges are with, we see availability at 68% and price at 32%. And thank you for everybody for participating in those. It's always very interesting to see what is going on in our industry. During the reception, we have a range of ways for you to engage with our other attendees through our one-on-one -on -one networking and sponsor expo. This week, our networking topic is centered around exploring any interruptions that you may have experienced in purchasing since the pandemic. Don't forget that you are entered in a raffle for each activity you engage in. And if you attend and participate all six weeks, you'll have a chance to win free registration and travel to next year's conference, where hopefully we can meet live together. Lastly, we hope that you'll let us know your thoughts and feedback on our virtual series through the evaluation survey, which you can access at this link, which you'll also get via email. Your feedback is incredibly important to us as we continue to iterate our virtual series for future weeks. And as we think about additional programming that we'll be able to use for you. Don't forget to join us next Wednesday for week four of this virtual series when we will virtually take a deeper look at the sources of confusion around red meat and carbohydrates, as well as other significant issues around health and sustainability. You'll find the full schedule at menusofchange.org. Same time, same place next week. And until then, enjoy the reception. Thank you all. <laughs>